Dear friends in Christ, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, fill your hearts with the eagerness as we anticipate the joy of our Christmas celebration. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for sending us the blessing of your Son, Christ Jesus, for the blessing of our salvation that we have through his name and the blessing that we have each day, knowing that we are your children. Help us this Advent season to continue to prepare our hearts as the time grows short for your second Advent as well, as we look forward to your coming again, coming again in glory and honor. Lord, until that day comes, may we look forward each day to serving you and praising your holy name. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The time is short, isn't it? As I was mentioning to the kids, probably most of you already have your decorations up. You're ready to go and you've celebrated many of your traditions already. I know for me, as I'm getting to be the ripe old age of 30, uh, I've become a little bit of nostalgic in my old age. I look back, and I look back over the, uh, the time of my childhood, and I think about how we used to always go out, and we'd go to the Christmas tree farms, and we'd cut down our tree, and we'd bring it home, and we had all, all sorts of traditions. We'd literally go through thousand little light bulbs, assorting them out so we could hang them on our tree. But probably you saw this coming what makes me most nostalgic is when I think about food and our Christmas feasts. I think about these foods that we would eat only once a year. These foods that most people don't even know how to pronounce unless you're from Norway or Sweden. Things such as raw beef and onions or guffelbeater and yulakaka. Things that graced our table only once a year, though, as we celebrated the Savior's birth. And I imagine some of you, as you get ready to celebrate Christmas, that you might have some of those same nostalgic memories. Things that as you've thought back over time, you thought about the first time that your child or your grandchild ripped open the paper of their package and, well, they didn't really care what was inside. They just loved the wrapping paper. Maybe you can remember the, the look on your parents' faces. I know it's going back a few years for some of you, but you remember the look on your parents' faces when you opened that package, the joy they had, the love that they shared. Things that you know, make good stories for the radio, for the internet, passed around in emails. Things that we enjoy remembering. Now we know that those memories pale in comparison to the majesty of the coming of our King. But, but boy, they do sure help to bless us during those times of trial. Those memories that we have, those traditions, that nostalgic feeling, it, it helps us in those times as the Christmas glow starts to fade. When we go about the rest of our year, when we go back to our normal lives, we, d we dwell on those memories because even amidst the, the rest of our lives, they help to remind us of who we are waiting for. They help to remind us of what we are waiting for, for that return of Christ. We turn to those memories because so often in our lives we, we find ourselves so far from that return, so far from those promises. In the Saturday Evening Post, many of you maybe have heard of that before, it was, there was a story printed some years ago, 1898, entitled, The Child Who Was King. And as the story goes, it, there was, a, young there was a, a king, King Rupert, who had this beautiful kingdom. And every year, he would seek to make his kingdom better and better and encourage it, not for altruistic purposes, but because he believed that every year on Christmas, the child would return, the Christmas child. And so he would spend all year long trying to take care of the poor, take care of the needy, make sure that they were okay, because he wanted the Christmas child to visit him. And the Christmas child visited the poor and needy first. Year after year he prepared. Weeks, months, years, decades ran into each other. And still he was disappointed. Still he waited. I wonder sometimes if we kind of know that idea of waiting. We get caught in this cycle, this Christmas cycle, this Advent cycle, this and then all right into Epiphany and into Lent and into Easter and back around again and again and again. We get into these cycles and we forget that there is a destination. We forget that there is a promised ending. But we get so caught up because we do get caught into the day-to-day -day lives that we live. We get so caught up into our world and we look at the way things are going and we struggle with that. We struggle with the way our lives are going and, and we look at the, the brokenness the emptiness. And we see so many desolate places around us. Sure, there's agencies like Goodwill or Salvation Army. Agencies like Lutheran World Relief, that they go out there and they, they try to fix some of the ills of our world. They try to fix some of that brokenness that's out there, put food on people's table and, and heat in their homes, but those agencies, 
they don't fix the brokenness of the heart, the desolation of our lives. So often those agencies, they, they go out there and we compare them to their good works to what God should be doing. I mean, let's just go back to our psalm today. As we read in our psalm, we know that God cares for His creation. But what about all those people who are going hungry? What about all those people who don't have homes? What about all, those, all the, the lands that are empty and, uh, and there's famines going on? Is God doing His job? Where is he amidst all those people? Where is he amidst those, those people struggling without their food or home? Or, or even in your personal lives, the trials you face. Where is he? It's a question that we should be asking at Advent, isn't it? Advent, a time where we prepare for the coming of our Lord, but so often it's hard for us to see him. But, but before we go too far, I don't want to get off page here. Let's go back to the beginning of that psalm that we read. Because I think it helps us to frame that question. Where is he? Psalm 147 starts out. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. The outcast, the brokenhearted, those who are without, the humble and the wicked. And yet we see all those things still, don't we? All these things that the psalmist said the Lord cares for. Instead, they've been replaced by greed and by selfish desire. Instead, they've been replaced by a self-centered pride that many of us, even as Christians, experience. Our psalmist gives us a picture of what we would say would be ideal, wouldn't it? And yet we don't see the ideal. Instead, we see the creation. Instead, we see this creation where where agencies try to cure the social ills that we have. Where we as the church, we, we try to help people along the way, but truly people are still hurting, aren't they? People are still lost. People are still without faith. These agencies, they go through these times of trial where people squander their gifts and their giving. So often we've seen where people have squandered the gifts we have, given in good intent, faithful to the Lord. So often in our lives, we experience these desolate places, don't we? This desolation where, where we find ourselves, we find ourselves so feeling, how on earth will the Lord fix this creation? How on earth will the Lord be able to repair this brokenness? Many of you, you, you you've, not, you've not experienced true hunger, but some of you have. Some of you have felt that pain in your stomach and the pain in your body from not eating. Some of you have only experienced the hunger of a soul longing for the answer to your prayers. Some of you, you've lost your homes, you've lost your jobs, you've lost cars, things like that. Some of you, you've only felt the bankruptcy of a heart broken. Some of you, most of you, have felt that pain of loss. A pain that you can't see on the outside, but it's a pain that that literally locks you into your bed and makes you squeeze your eyes shut. And no matter how hard you try to close your eyes, you still feel that pain crawling in and creeping in. Some of you have felt physical pain that is so unbearable that it brings you to your knees and leaves you crying like a little child. All of us have felt these places of desolation, haven't we? We've been in these places of desolation, and and for each of us it's different. It it is. It's truly different. But we've all been in that place where we've looked back and that nostalgic Christmas, Christmas memory, instead of bringing us joy, it was only brought us more weariness and wonder when the Lord will come again, when He will restore us. There are so many human agencies out there that try to, but they can't. Because there's only one who can restore the creation. There is only one, and that is Jesus Christ, because he is not just above us, looking down, tossing us a breadcrumb every now and again, but he came down and took on human flesh. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, came down into our world. He became just like us. And when I say that, I mean he wasn't just watching suffering, but he experienced suffering just as we experienced suffering. When he showed compassion to the people, He felt the pain of loss. Just 
a few chapters after our reading from today about John the Baptist. He was put to death. That's the cousin of Jesus. And Jesus, he, his heart was broken. It tells us in Scripture, he intentionally went off to a desolate place to get away so that he could mourn that death. But still he showed compassion. Still he showed love because he knew what our suffering was. He knew in a very real way what our pain is. And he knew more than any of us what desolation is. Because while we feel desolate places on this earth sometimes, not in a literal sense, although sometimes that is the case, but in a very figurative sense, those desolate places of our heart, Jesus knew it in a way that we will never understand because he felt the desolation of being separated from the Father. The desolation of being forsaken by the Father and completely abandoned. And he experienced that desolation for us. He experienced that desolation so that we would know the restoration of our salvation. Because only Jesus is the one who can restore this creation. Only Jesus is the one who can restore our lives. And the psalmist, he paints a beautiful picture. He does. And let me share you another place because another place in the psalm, Psalm chapter 107. Because right here, the psalmist paints a picture of what it means when Jesus restores his creation. What it means when Jesus restores your life and my life. Some wandered in the desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works for the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and hungry soul he fills with good things. Sometimes it doesn't seem like the right moment for us. Sometimes it seems like we're at the end of our rope and that, in fact, the rope has run out and there's not even space to tie a knot on the end and climb back up. And sometimes in those places, every time in those places, the Lord restores his people. He lifts up his people. He lifts up his children, his sons and his daughters. He gives us that feast that we cannot imagine. He quenches our thirst in ways that we would not believe. You know, I'm I'm reminded of another occasion where Jesus, in a literal way, took care of satisfying the hunger of people. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew describes a desolate place, a desolate hillside, where Jesus had gone off to pray. That was where he'd gone to get away for, to to pray about John the Baptist to mourn. But the crowds followed him. They chased after him. They needed something. They were in a world broken by sin and death. And and they heard words of hope. And so they came to Jesus. And Jesus preached and he preached and he preached. And he went on for hours. And the people, they got tired and they got hungry. But they were in a desolate place. There was nowhere for them to go to get food. So they came to the disciples. And the disciples came to Jesus. And Jesus said, you feed them. The disciples were a little uh, concerned there. And as you probably realize, I'm referring to the feeding of the 5,000. Where Jesus fed the people, both physically and spiritually. But you know, there's something that it's easy to skip over when we look at that text. Because right at the beginning of that text is one of my favorite parts of the whole text. It's right at the beginning, and and it's only in Matthew's Gospel. But right in the beginning, right before the feeding of the 5,000, it says Jesus had compassion on the people. Jesus had compassion on them. And the word that's used there is the word splagnizomai. And that's a Greek word. But it, and it doesn't mean from his heart, but it means that Jesus from his very bowels, from his stomach, from the bottom of the pit of his stomach, he cared for the people. He loved the people. And when he looked upon them, his heart broke for them. When he looks upon us today, he has splagnizomai for us. Us wandering and lonely in the desolate places of this life, he still looks upon us just as he looked upon those people then as he fed them with the finest of wheat, he still feeds us and restores us today. As we go through those deep, dark, desolate places of our lives, he still looks upon us with that compassion. And he pours out his heart for us. And he walks right beside us. And he takes hold of us when we can't walk any further. And he carries us through. Because that is what our God does. He is the restorer who can restore to spite this broken world. Because He is the one who loves us despite our rebellious nature. He is the one who cares for us despite our lost and wandering ways. And He is the one whose advent we do await. 
because we await a day when there will be no more desolate places, when there will be no more broken lives and, and sin in this world. We await a day when we will be able to celebrate together in his holy presence. It's easy to get caught up and just think that we're on one big cycle, day after day, week after week, year after year, going around and around and around like King Rupert did, waiting for the Christ child. But we have a hope. We have a hope of a destination. Because we know that when Christ came the first time to restore the creation, that he is coming again to completely restore our lives. And we look forward to that day, to that destination. And so we say, O come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks to you for Christ Jesus, our Savior. We know that so often in this life that, we've, that we, we lose faith, that we lose trust, that we fall into these desolate places where we struggle to see your, you at work. Lord, we ask that in those times that you would restore us, that you would lead us back to you, that, we, that you would lead us to those living waters that come through your word. Lord, we pray for those who are going through those desolate places right now, those who are lost amidst their, the, the, in this life. We ask, Lord, that you would lift them up and that you would make them whole, that even in the midst of their pain and suffering, that they would know you are there. Lord, we thank you for your care and compassion. But most of all, we thank you for the promise that we have, that one day you shall restore us in all of creation, that one day we will join you in your presence, and that we will forever live with you. Lord, we pray that, you, that amidst our desolation, des, desolation, that we would know the restoration of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.